passion. Uh, people have lots of different kinds of passion uh, about life and about things. And I want to just show you a couple of illustrations of people who are passionate. They stick out when someone's passionate, don't they? Uh, let's start with bumper stickers. <laughs> this person is passionate about one thing, basically. What would you say? Are they in the army? Well, I don't really quite know because it does say army retired in the middle of that one little logo there. Uh, but pretty much I'm thinking if I'm driving behind this person, they're all about the U.S. Marine Corps. Any Marines here full of passion? Two, three? Okay, you're kind of outnumbered. Uh, it might be an army church, I don't know, or this service, but love the Marine Corps. Uh, one of my mentors growing up was a U.S. Marine, uh, World War II. Uh, so I have great respect for uh, Marines. Uh, this guy's totally passionate about it, isn't he? Wouldn't you agree? How about this next uh, vehicle, if you're driving behind this person? Um, I like this. I was an honor student. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty funny. They like canoeing, uh, et cetera. Uh, but down here in the right-hand quadrant of their bumper, it says, proud parent of United States Army Ranger. Yeah, any of those here? People who jump out of airplanes and all kinds of crazy things, hang onto ropes out of helicopters. Where are they? Raise your hands, confess now. Yeah, who are they here? Yeah, and they all have their own war cries. I just find that it's some kind of Hebrew statement, I think, somewhere that they've come up with. But, uh, you know, I like this buy American products, the job you say may be your own. Uh, they love New York, so guess where they're probably from? Not Texas. This is your passion. And I always, I love looking at bumper stickers on cards. Sometimes what you read is diametrically opposed to the statements on different parts of the card. Do they even know this? Um, but let's move on in the passion concept to other things that people are passionate about. Here's one you might be able to relate to uh, uh, when you think about football. I remember in pre-COVID pre when you actually stand this close to other people, you know? Uh, now, when you go to a football game and people are going extra psycho, there's always some really crazy weightlifter looking dudes that look like that, Right? paint in their face. You think they do that during the week? I think not. But when you put them at a game with their team and they're just all about looking crazy, is that their hair? What would you say? Probably not. I mean, you got a guy putting on a wig to look crazy like he's out of the 70s or something? I don't know. I don't know. But they're passionate about their team, are they not? You got to ask yourself, if these guys are four Christians, I wonder what they look like when they go to worship on Sunday. Probably not that. Uh, here's another concept of passion. Sometimes people are, I'm not, you know, passionate about football. Maybe you're passionate about food because I take Food Fanatic magazine. Did you know that magazine even existed? And now you're thinking, I'm so glad I went to church today. Now I know what magazine I need to get because I'm a fanatic about food. Because uh, you're passionate about it. Now, if you're really passionate, you're going to be watching the next show. <laughs> How many watch this? Yeah, I, I confess, we do. Listen, I watch this. Why are you watching this? Well, it, it blows me away how he can eat and still be alive like he does. You know what I'm saying? It's unbelievable. It's like the guy should weigh like 500 pounds. If he's still looking good, driving a nice car, I think it's a, what was it, a rebuilt Camaro. Oh, it's just so sweet. That was my first car. Yeah, it's just so sweet. But diners, dive in, dry, diners uh, drive ins, and dives. Uh, have you ever gone to one of these restaurants that he said go to? We, we have, and it's like, wow, was he right. So uh, I love his passion. I wish I had his hair. I'm thinking about dyeing my hair that color. I think it would improve church membership. Like, <laughs> could you imagine? Anyway, back to my sermon. This is passion. So people are passionate about all kinds of things, are they not? So if you're a Christian, you should be looking at the passion flowing around you and ask yourself, but am I that passionate about God? I mean, is my passion for God that evident that people get around me, they're like, whoa. That person is totally passionate about their walk with God. See, that's, that's Psalm 84. It's a psalm about passion. Uh, and he's going to give us five things that a maturing Christian should know about being passionate about God. When you come to worship, it's like going to the football game. You don't, you don't sit there like, uh, uh, like you're a wooden Indian, not moving, right? And don't, don't freak out because my great-great-grandparents were both Choctaw full-blooded Indians. So don't, don't be distracted. You're just stilted is what I'm saying. You, you're not moving. Uh, do you do that at a football game? No. Every game I go, somebody here at church gave Liz, Liz, and, uh, Liz, Liz and I tickets to 50-yard line to a, to a game to watch the, uh, the Washington uh, Redskins play back in the day when they were called that. 
They're playing New York Giants. We're 50 yard line, a couple seats up from the 50 yard line, primo. And the minute the game started, what did everybody do? They stood up and they stood for the entire game. And Liz is like, what's up with these people? They're passionate. They're passionate. You know, so when you go to a, when you come to worship, are you passionate about worship? Or it is more like, oh no, we gotta go again. Oh, Marty's back. It's gonna be boring. <laughs> or, or whatever, you know? Uh, think about it. So, what does worship passion look like in a person that's in love with God? I mean, really maturing into relationships. So, let's look at what the psalmist says. He's gonna share you his passion. Uh, learn from him. He says, This is uh, written to the chief musician on the instrument of Gath. Uh, who knows what that is? Uh, it is a song of the songs of Korah. So this is a superscription in the Hebrew text, and they are in the English text, uh, that you might think was added by the editors of the Bible, and it's not really part of the biblical text. Uh, you'd be wrong. In a Hebrew text, this is verse 1, translated, this is inspired. Most people read quickly through it and jump right into the English verse 1. Don't pay attention to the superscription or the heading, which is part of the original inspired text from God. So what does it say? Well, this is written to the chief worship leader. Uh, we don't have one right now because uh, our worship leader, Darren, left, uh, I don't know, a year and a half ago. And by, by the way, Liz and I had dinner with uh, Darren and Lisa the other night. They're doing great. They said to say hi. Um, and where else would you go with your best friend when you're in Texas but to your favorite barbecue? <laughs> yeah, we did. It's a place where you order meat like by the poundage. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. I was like, how do I order here? Well, you either, uh, you know, a quarter pound of brisket, you know, a half pound of, of ribs. And I mean, like, but how much is this? Uh, so uh, it's called Hard Eight. If you've never been there, it'll change your life and your waistline. But anyway, back to the sermon. So this is like, give this psalm to the chief worship pastor of your church and have them play this on the gath. What is a gath? Does anybody know? I don't know. I looked it up in Hebrew. There's not much about it in the lexical entry. Uh, Because no one really knows what it is. So we can substitute for this. If you're the main worship leader, make sure you play this on, you know, a keyboard. Or uh, play it on a Stratocaster, some kind of guitar. Or, you know, play it with a band or something like that. But when you play this, make sure it sounds like this. And then he says, uh, make sure that uh, the sons of Korah are doing the lead singing. Who are they? Most people will read right over this before they get into the whole concept. Uh, Think about the sons of Korah. They are descendants of Korah. Who is Korah? Korah was a priest uh, back in the time of Moses uh, who led an insurrection with Dathan and Abiram against the leadership of Moses. Good idea, bad idea? Bad idea. Because they got tired of this old man Moses leading them all through the wilderness, wanted to throw off his leadership because they knew better. Uh, and so they got together, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And they, number 16 says they, they, they attempted to overthrow the leadership of Moses. That was God appointed. God does not approve of those who attack the shepherd that he appointed. So what did God do? Uh, just by way of uh, Old Testament review, God said, I don't like your insurrection, so I'm going to send a localized earthquake, ground against the rumble, uh, out, uh, uh, the ground opens, they all fall in, and the ground closes. Argument over. <laughs> you ever been at a church where they had an argument in a business meeting? See, everybody's getting quiet now. When I've seen it, it's kind of an ugly thing. Uh, we have great business meetings here, by the way. I've, I've enjoyed the 12 years of them here. When I was in California for 19 years, we had some gnarly meetings. I'm thinking, God, when's the earthquake coming? Could you imagine if an earthquake opened with the opposition? <laughs> Floor opens, all those chairs disappeared, and it's closed. I mean, that's kind of what happened here. So you could think about, this psalm is, they want the sons of Korah? I mean, that, that was a dysfunctional family with sinful issues. Does that stop God from blessing a family? No. No, he says, yeah, I judged your family, all those people back then, but that sin is not your sin. You're responsible for your own sin, and I want you guys to be my main worship leaders, and that's who they were, sons of Korah. So what's that say? In the, in the current age, when it comes to worship, the dysfunction of your family, the sins of your family, uh, God's looking at that going, oh, I got greater things in store for you, because I still use people from situations like that. But that's not part of my sermon. That's just kind of That's like extra off to the side. Because he wants to give us the five things that maturing believers should have in their passion. So let's look at number one. Maturing believers are passionate, ipso facto, about worship. I mean, this kind of stands to reason. He says, notice the first four verses. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. The tabernacle, the word tabernacle in Hebrew means tent. So 
he could be denoting the tabernacle that preceded the temple, the tent structure where God dwelt and Israel worshiped God in the wilderness, or he could be speaking about the temple structure that Solomon built. I think it's uh, the temple structure that Solomon built because later in the text, he's gonna pray, tell you, if you're really in love with worship, you're gonna pray for your political leader, your king, the anointed one. Well, that happened during the period of the kings, i.e. when the temple was built. But either way, he's saying, when I think about worship you got, I I get all excited about the building. Do you? Do you get excited about the building? I mean, whatever the building is, do you get excited just thinking about, man, I can't wait to go there. I mean, when when I've uh, uh, had the privilege of uh, being in California in close proximity to where I grew up in El Centro, California, um, uh, like for my 20th high school reunion, which was about, I don't know, about 30 years past 20 years. um, But I remember going to my home church and just standing out front of it, where I got saved, where I grew up, where my parents got married, all my memories there, everything. Just to stand out front, it was like, man, how lovely is this old building? I mean, I have so many wonderful spiritual experiences tied to that building. He's saying, God, when when I show up at worship and I see the house of worship, I just get all excited. Do you? Do you get excited? He says, I, I love your tabernacle. He says, uh, oh, Lord of hosts. This is the, the, the Lord of armies. He says, I get, I get excited. Why does he think the temple structure is so beautiful? Let me give you two answers to the question. Uh, number one, uh, when I take people to Israel on tours, and yes, we are planning on going in March of 2022, I take, 20, I take 55 people with us. That's how many fit on the bus. We have 120 signed up. So you can still sign up because some people will back out for different things and the line will move around. So just make sure you're on the list. I already had somebody this morning ask me. So uh, when we go to Israel, one of the first things we do when we're in Jerusalem is we go look at the, uh, the model of Jerusalem, ancient Jerusalem in the time of Christ, so people can understand as we're going to the different sites what it looked like in the time of Christ. But last time I was there uh, a year and a half ago, I took this picture which would mean uh, uh, if you were on the hills of Moab looking uh, west, uh, the temple structure faced east. Uh, and this would be the, the temple itself proper uh, with the court of the priest right in front of it with the altar where they sacrificed. Uh, but uh, a scholar said when you study the temple structure of how it was constructed with the high front uh, building, then it, uh, it went down from there. And then the side rooms where they stored things off uh, on the sides of it, they were lower. They said when you looked at it uh, from the side, it looked like a crouching lion. Why? Well, because of Genesis chapter 49, verses 10 and following, uh, the, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the Messiah, is, is going to be the savior, the king of the nation. I mean, he's the essence of the nation. The whole temple just reflects him. But you can notice the white stone structure with the gold, etc. W- imagine when the sun came up over the eastern mountains of Moab, m- modern day Jordan, when it hit this brilliant structure. It must have just glistened when they saw it. He says, how lovely is it? Indeed it is. Lovely. And I've walked all over the 24 acres of the, uh, what's left of the complex today. I've gone down in the rabbinical tunnels underneath the Temple Mount many times to see the Solomonic stones uh, and the Herodian stones above those Solomonic stones that are carved uh, with a frame in the stones that weigh 60 tons. Unbelievable. And you're standing on Solomonic stones thinking, this is, this is holy, this is amazing. That's where the temple was. He says, God, I, I get so excited when I see the building. Another reason why, because it was be- literally beautiful. Uh, and it was beautiful because he knew, uh, for secondarily, in light of how beautiful the building was, that when God gave the tabernacle instructions in Genesis 30, uh, 20, or not Genesis, Exodus 25 to uh, 40, he started with the construction of the tabernacle in the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant. And then he worked his way out to the altar of sacrifice, out to the front door of the tabernacle. One door. Remember Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. He's the door. Uh, And so he said, I I, I think it's so lovely because it starts with the Ark of the Covenant where there's mercy for sinners. And you started there first because you who are holy came to us who are sinners first. And it went out from there, uh, past the altar of incense, the table of showbread, the menorah, went out to the front door to the altar of sacrifice where sins are covered by the appropriate sacrifice for sinners. And you came to us first, God. He says, that's lovely, is it not? He said, I get excited when I think about that. Uh, we today, is, uh, we can sit here and overanalyze this and say, well, hey, Marty, uh, the temple's gone. Uh, yeah, true. Because now the temple's different, is it not? Where's the temple of God now? Do you know? It's you. It's you. This is not a trick question. It's you. Uh, we know from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, 
chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. I mean, so we daily are the temple of the Spirit of God. What a privilege that is. Uh, but we are also called, in Hebrews 10, 24, and 25, uh, to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as is the habit of some. It's a command that, yeah, you might be the temple of the Spirit of God, and you are as a Christian. He comes to dwell in you at the moment of conversion, but don't forsake corporate worship. I cannot tell you how many people two weeks ago when I was here for Easter came up to me during the service and said something like, to me, like this to me. Hey, we've been gone for a year watching online. It was so good to be in this house of worship today. Why? There's nothing like being with other believers. I mean, online worship is good to a degree, but it just feels so right when you're with other Christians and you can see them with their mask on. <laughs> and you can talk to them. And you can laugh with them, you can pray with them, you can hug them, etc. cetera. Um, but he said, it just feels so right. And he's absolutely right. It's a beautiful thing to be in God's house. How lovely is that, that temple? When you come to God's house, do you feel that way? Notice the names he uses of God. He calls him the Lord of hosts, which is uh, Yahweh Sabaoth, which is the, the Lord of armies. What, what armies? Angelic armies. Remember Elijah? I love this story. Elijah's surrounded by the Syrians. They think they've got him. <laughs> Whole army against one godly prophet. And, and Elijah's prophet's freaking out in 2 Kings chapter 6. We're surrounded by the Syrians. It's over for us. And what does Elijah do? He says, you know, God basically let him see who's really with us. And God lets him see with the eyes of faith the, into God's dimension where they see the Syrians are outnumbered, well, by the Lord's army. And it's a totally different perspective. And so when he says, God, I, I love your, your house of worship, uh, and I call you the Lord of armies, because his perspective is, no matter what happens in my life, my perspective is, those same armies that were with Elijah are with me on a daily basis. It gives great hope. He says in verse 2 about his passion uh, for worship, my soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh, they cry out for the living God. My soul longs to be in worship. I mean, think about that. Do you really feel that way? Or is it like, oh, mom, we got to go again? Or, or what? He said, no, my, my soul longs to be there. Um, this is, in the Hebrew text, this is a, a perfect tense, which could, could be grammatically cl classified for those who are in seminary. And we have 170 students because we're the East Coast campus for the DTS uh, uh, campus, uh, main campus. Uh, so some are studying Hebrew here. Um, it could be classified as a, as a present perfect, meaning he continually, it's just how he rolls. He's continually just in worship. I mean, uh, I probably don't have to tell you at this point what my main passion is outside being a Christian. I mean, you could probably guess, right? Yard work. Yard work, gardening. I mean, it is. I love going back and forth with a mower. I love trimming stuff and making it into designs. I mean, it's just, I live for this stuff. Uh, so it's hard for me to be inside on a day like this when my lawn isn't in mode in about 10 days. It's freaking me out. <laughs> But when you, when, you think about your, when you think about a passion that you have for God, um, you know, you, you, you just long to do it. So when I used to uh, be a landscaper and was on cruise and stuff in California, uh, I mean, I couldn't believe they were paying me for what I love to do. I mean, every time I get a check, it's like, thanks for the money. But man, I was having a good time because I enjoy this. But most of the time when I'm gardening, I'm having God thoughts. I mean, really do. It's my time to meditate. Because the, the lawn can't speak back to me, can't send me emails, can't criticize, can't do this, can't do that. It's awesome. And I can be artistic and stuff like that. Uh, but I'm, you know, sometimes I'll be singing a hymn to myself. You know, like I come to the garden alone, you know, when the dew is still on the roses. And who's there? Jesus, he walks with me, he talks with me. I've sang that to myself many times. I mean, just having worship. Or, or back in the day, this is gonna date myself. I used to haul around as a landscaper my cassette player <laughs> and play sermons from pastors that I loved on that. You know, it's just, it, it just ministered to me. You know, I'd take my best friend, Alan, who just got out of San Quentin, spent, I don't know, 12 years in the penal system of California. And I, he got saved in, in, the, in, in uh, San Quentin. And uh, so Alan and I would hang out on our, on our lawn crew together. And we'd, we'd walk around. I was discipling him. And we'd walk around with the cassette player. He was playing sermons. I mean, it's my soul longs. And, and during the week, I long to be in worship, but I worship God during the week. Uh, and it, it's just what, it's what I'm constantly thinking about. Is it? I mean, because if you're a maturing Christian, you just have that passion to be in worship. He says, uh, my heart and my flesh, they cry out for the living God. That is a sign of a, of a believer who's really growing up in God. Uh, verse three, I love this verse. My, <laughs> he says, when I think about little birds having homes at the temple, I'm envious. 
He says, even a sparrow has found a home at the temple and a swallow, a nest for herself where she may lay her young, even your altars. He says, O Lord of hosts, I seen birds flying around there. I mean, I first read this uh, a couple of weeks ago and I was studying, I'm thinking, what is he talking about? What is he talking about? I wish I was a bird who could just live there on the precincts. Why? Uh, just to be near where the worship of God happens. That's amazing. I remember the first time I uh, was invited uh, to go down to the White House to pray for uh, Vice President Pence's staff. Uh, uh, he had just been uh, elected uh, and they called me at Easter, right be a couple of days before Easter and said, can you drop everything and come down here and pray for us? I actually told them I need to think about it. My staff freaked out. But I'm like, well, it's Easter. I'm super busy. Uh, and so I called him back and I told, uh, I told uh, his chief of staff, uh, yes, I, I, I can move my schedule around. I could come down. And I went down and spent a couple hours down there uh, with seven of his staff at the time and prayed for them. Uh, and when I left, uh, the chief of staff walked me out of the uh, uh, Eisenhower Center uh, out to the gate uh, to go to my car. And he stopped talked to me for about 25 minutes. And he said, thank you for coming here today. We face evil itself. And I said, that's why I came. Because anybody in political leadership, whatever your party is, faces evil, do they not? And so, uh, you know, it, it's one of those things is to, uh, when I went down there, I, I was walking in, I went through security. It was like, this is a cool, holy moment, moment being this sacred place of our country. Uh, and I went between the, uh, when I left, I went between the uh, Eisenhower Center and the White House where they parked the president's limo. And I saw the limo there when I came out and I'm like, whoa. There's no one around. I got the special badge. I can walk around. And, and then there's no one here. There is the president's car. This is like, whoa. And, I, and then I began to analyze the turf. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, this turf is looking good. It's tight, nice, trimmed, everything good. I see some spotted spurge over there. It's kind of freaking me out. Uh, and I'm thinking to myself, if I could just have a job here. I mean, if I, if, if I could retire and just get a job there as a gardener, I would be the happiest gardener on the entire planet. See, this is that passion. Your passion, is, this is your passion. He said, if I could just be at the temple of priest sphinx where I can hear the songs of worship, hear the word of God preached, and just do this on a daily basis, man, that would be enough for me. You gotta ask yourself, am I that passionate about worship where this is what I think about? I just love to be around people worshiping God. It ministers to me. Next, he says, if you're a maturing worshiper who's passionate about God, you're gonna recognize God's provision before you come to worship on a given Shabbat, Sunday. Verses five to seven. Blessed is the man whose strength is in who? You, God, not in himself, in God, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. This is holy pilgrimage uh, to, to uh, Jerusalem. Uh, as they pass through the valley of Baca, and Baca in Hebrew means to weep bitterly. Uh, they, they, the worshipers, on their holy pilgrimage to Jerusalem, they make it, the Valley of Baca, the Valley of Weeping or Adversity, a spring. Uh, they have a positive impact on it. Uh, the rain also covers it with pools. They go as they head to worship from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. So uh, a Jewish man had to be in, in Jerusalem three times a year uh, by divine mosaic mandate. They had to be there for Passover, Pesach, uh, for uh, Pentecost or Shavuot, uh, or they had to be there for tabernacle, tabernacles, which was Sukkoth. So they had to be there for those three times. So this man might be explaining his journey up to Jerusalem, into the mountains of Jerusalem, to the holy temple. He might be talking about one of those pilgrimages, or he might just be talking about what happens as he makes pilgrimage to worship. But he says, when, when I go there, I know I'm blessed. Because during the week as I travel to worship, I encounter adverse situations. Think about yourself. When you came to worship this morning, did you encounter an adverse situation? Somebody cut you off? Somebody pulled in front of you and slowed down? I mean, something happened to you? Probably not. But what happens is, who has not come to worship on a Sunday morning, put all the kids in the car, and you had a gnarly argument come in here? Ever happened to you? And then you pop out of your car, hallelujah, hallelujah. Uh, man, <laughs> yeah, should have seen this five minutes ago on Fairfax County Parkway. It was brutal. You know, you ever had that happen? It's kind of embarrassing, isn't it? I mean, that's the Valley of Baca. You know, but it's even bigger than that. It's like you went through your week and you faced that adversity. Got a phone, phone call from a doctor, info you didn't want to hear. 
That's, that's your Valley of Baca. As you're heading to worship on Sunday, you got some news you didn't want to hear. Or, 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 or a boss told you something that you didn't want to hear in a memo that he sent you. But you had your adverse time. When, when you are a worshiper that loves God and loves to be with God, you take your Valley, valley of Baca, and, it, and it's a positive thing for you. You're there to impact the people around you in a positive way, not a negative way. That's what he says. That as you're headed there and you're p- passing through this valley, you make it a spring So where there is no water, you are the water. Why? Because you're in love with God and you know God is with you and you know that God is gonna bless you because you're worshiping him and you're gonna bless everybody around you. When you leave a house of worship, there should be such a glow and joy about you that when you go out through your valley of Baca in the the week, people are blessed because, man, there's something about that person. I mean, all this bad stuff's going on, but they're happy about what? Well, they walk with God. And notice he says, they make it a spring and then the rain also covers it, which means uh, you do your part during the week and then God does his part. He sends rain on your life. He blesses your life. Why? Because you're maturing in the faith and you understand uh, that God is with you. Is that your maturing view of God? Should be. Third thing, maturing worshipers are passionate about prayers for leaders. This is most convicting. Notice what he says. O Lord of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Uh, Oh God, behold our shield and look upon the face of who? Your anointed. Uh, Messiah is the word in Hebrew. Uh, Messiah is the word from which you get the word Messiah. Uh, The Greek version is Christos, uh, Jesus' name, Jesus Christos. Uh, uh, It's the anointed one. It's, It's the Messiah. It's the king. He's saying, if I'm maturing in my worship of God, I will be maturing to the point where I pray for leaders in my nation. This is very interesting. Notice the words he uses. He calls him the God of hosts, the God of armies. He calls him the God of Jacob or the God who's covenantally loyal to his people. He calls God his shield who will protect him no matter what happens politically that's going on. And he says, I I, I, as a maturing believer uh, worship God and I also am careful to take time in worship to pray for my leaders. Why? Because they face evil itself. Daniel chapter 2, Daniel speaking to Nebuchadnezzar, the greatest king that ever lived at the day and time, most powerful, uh, tells this to the king. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he, the living God, changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings. He raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Who is God? Who's the true God? He put you in office. He gave you your appointment. You're not there Uh, because X amount of people voted you in or so-and-so chose you for this job or whatever. No, ultimately, whether you're Republican or Democrat, whatever the season is of political leadership, who really put him there? The living God Almighty put him there for his purposes, which means it doesn't matter if it's a Republican leader, a Democratic leader. They all have clay feet. They all have sin, do they not? What should we be doing? Praying for them praying for them. Why? God placed them there for his purposes. And we need to pray for those men and women, no matter what their position of leadership is. This should be what maturing believers are doing is praying for them. What should we be praying? I'll give you some ideas. No matter who the leader is, that God would, uh, that God would move them to love him and his way above all things. That our leaders would love law and hate lawlessness. That our leaders would love principle, not power, that our leaders would live lives free of hypocrisy. Sometimes I don't think they see it at all. That our leaders would unite us, not divide us. Because what does the devil do so well? He divides. What does God do so well? He unites. That our leaders, no matter who they are, Republican or Democrat, would love for unity in the nation. That our leaders would strive for moral living and eschew immoral living. Uh, That our leaders would be wise as opposed to naive concerning our enemies. And on and on goes my list. Many things to pray for when it comes to a leader. So when there's a change in leadership, what should the maturing believers do? Political analysis is what we do. We analyze everything. No, you should be saying, God Almighty, you need to touch and anoint that leader, convict them, move them, fill them, bless them. May I live to see the day that you use them in a great way. That's what a mature believer does. Maturing worshipers are also passionate about uh, why they worship. He says in verse 10, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere, basically. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. He said, I I don't care what anybody else says. I would rather be here worshiping God one day than to spend thousands of days doing all the stuff the culture says they should do. I mean, go pick it. I'd rather be here than at a Nats game. 
Oh, that's convicting. I would be here, rather here than at a concert at Wolf Trap. You see what I'm saying? But you don't understand. Uh, you know, my favorite group is playing. It, it's okay. Uh, you, you need to be in worship. Because when you love God, it, it's, I, I'd rather be here than any place else. The way I grew up, my parents, it was, you went to church, Sunday school in the morning, church, uh, went home, ate basically dinner at grandma's house, and then came back to church that night. That was my whole life. I remember one time asking my parents, could I not go? <laughs> I remember, they, I was really scared to ask. I was 12. And, you know, my dad came in and says, what's the, what's the problem? I don't want to go to church today. Well, where do you want to go? My friend Kenny's going to a drag race. I want to go to the drag race. Because I've got funny cars. I've built models. I want to see them in person. Son, do you realize today's the day to worship God? I know. I never miss. You think God would be upset if I miss one time? Well, it's your decision. <laughs> anyway, right. Then my mom came in. Honey, what are you thinking? Um, I just want to go to a drag race. Well, anyway, so I decided. Guess what I did? I went to the drag race. I was miserable. I was miserable. The whole time I'm thinking, this is so loud, I can't hear. You know? And it, the smell of all the fuel and everything. Uh, it was awesome to see, but I never did it again because it's better to be in the house of God, worshiping the living God, than going doing something like that. Because I was with God's people. And then lastly, he says, maturing passionate worshipers are passionate about sharing the new perspective God gave them when they're in worship. I mean, if you walk out of here thinking, yeah, I got nothing from that. Oh, I, yeah, I don't know. You need to be thinking because God always speaks. He says, the Lord of God is a sun and a shield. He got this from worship. The Lord will give grace and glory. He got that from worship. Nor no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly, which the opposite's true. If you don't walk uprightly and you choose to sin, God's not going to be going before you because you're swimming against the flow. He says, O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. It's like the, uh, a spoked wheel. He's the hub. And when you don't have the hub of worship in the middle, all the spokes are all messed up. But he said, when I put you first above all things and worship you, man, my life just comes to center. He says, God, you're our son. You give sunshine to my life. You bring produce and blessing to my life. Uh, somebody just asked me a while ago, uh, or said to me uh, as I met them, God bless you. And I said, God has blessed me because he's my son. Uh, I got that from worship. He's my shield. He's there to protect me from the fiery darts of the devil. See, when you walk out of worship, you should be walking out with great passion that God gave you something for the day. And maybe you need to come up with your own bumper sticker. Here's two ideas. Here's one. This person is saying they're never going to speed. <laughs> How could they? Praying hands and the cross in between them. You could pass them all day long. Because <laughs> what are they passionate about? Jesus first, I worship God. Here's another one. Oh, we're studying Revelation on Sunday nights at 6.30. <laughs> this person's passionate about eschatology. In case of rapture, and this car is abandoned and my clothes are in it, I'm gone. You know, I'm, I'm telling the lost, you better get right with Jesus. He already took the church. He's coming in the second coming. But passion, do you have passion? That's a maturing believer. May God give it to you. Let's pray. God, thank you for the opportunity to worship you. There's much to be passionate about. Forgive us of our faith is dead, lackadaisical, lacks true uh, excitement. Uh, put excitement in ourselves for you, the great living God. Uh, bless us greatly uh, as we follow you in Jesus' name. Amen.